Good morning, everybody. I look a little distracted this morning. I forgot my phone down there. I wanted to welcome everybody this morning. It's beautiful outside. See all these wonderful, wonderful faces. To those that were missing online, we're glad you're watching this morning, but we really wish you were here because we have so much fun praising the Lord, being together, and we're one big family. Wanted to read something this morning. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Romans 12, 21. Paul's prescription for how to triumph over evil is much more specific. It doesn't begin with action, but with attitude. Whatever we do to defeat evil must be motivated by sincere love. Our actions must also spring from the right moral base. We cannot use evil to defeat evil, but must learn to hate what is evil and cling to what is good. So always remember, do not overcome evil, but overcome. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So we need to remember that every day. Right now, we've got a lot going on in life, in Maine, in Israel. I mean, local, I think it was Fayetteville. We've got a lot of crazy stuff going on. But remember, we've got to do it with good, and we've got to make sure we keep that same moral attitude. So if you all be prepared, we're going to start with prayer this morning. Let's bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time that we can come in your house to worship, Lord. We ask your Holy Spirit to fill this room. We know a lot of things are going on in this world right now, Lord, but we know you're in control. And one day, one day, probably not too far off, there's going to be a time where there's no war, there's no conflict. There'll be peace and joy and happiness through you, Lord. And that's the only way to find it because the alternative is just too horrible to think about. Lord, we ask your blessings on everyone here today. Please hear our praises. Listen to our voices as we sing to you. Sing your praises. Answer our prayers, please, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 If you can, let's stand up and start our praise of the Lord this morning.
take a shower, get dressed, daily walking with Jesus. That is it. Um, Want to get prayer requests, praise reports. Um, I have tried to keep it up to date, so please look over this every day. Keep me posted. If somebody is wanting to be on the praise list instead of the prayer report, I, I need it. We want to keep remembering Sheila and her family and her prayers. Her brother passed away, and we love them. We love you guys. We love you. We do. Anybody else? Praise report? Prayer request? My wife's prayer. She got a shingle shot seven months ago, and it's only getting worse and worse. Her arms are perfect this year. Mm. 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 Definitely keep her. Joanna and her prayers. I saw a hand raised over here. Yes, ma'am. Everybody at Circle Florence has COVID. <laughs> Florist in our prayers. They have been wonderful helping us out over the years with our beautiful arrangements from Scarlet. So let's keep those folks in our prayers. I have a prayer request. Yes, sir. My grandson got <coughs> at 7 o'clock this morning and his little fish Nemo died. Oh, no. Oh, no. Nemo. Oh, no. Uh, uh, let's keep Hayes in our prayers because you know with children, parents, especially Nemo. Nemo. Give her the strength to get it through. Yes. All right, I got one thing to read. I know it was. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, we've got that on here for sure. It's very scary. Yeah. Definitely keep all the folks in Maine in our prayers.
appreciation we did mention that a few weeks ago and we do appreciate our man not just because he's my husband but I appreciate I want to do the same thing. Thank you Lord and I'm gonna cry. <laughs> Dear Lord I pray for my husband and everybody here can say this as well. I pray for any silent battles he may be facing. I pray as he stands on the front lines of our household to lead, protect and provide. I pray for the ways the enemy may be targeting him. Okay. I pray for his boldness to speak your name above everything. I pray for his strength and confidence in the areas he may feel insufficient or unworthy. I pray that he will continue to seek you first and use your love as an example of how to love me. And I thank you for allowing me to walk along beside him. I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you, remembering you in my prayers. Ephesians 1 16. I want to, uh, I want to personally say thank you to Alan because I was out uh, sick and uh, he did my job and did a good job, a great job, I think. And uh, I mean, as much as he's got to do, y'all just don't know how much he does. He does things for everybody. He's a phone call away. Every time I text him or call him, he gets back with me immediately. And I know he does everybody else. And I just want to tell him I appreciate him doing that for me. With all the stuff he has to do, he has to do my job. <laughs> so, so, you don't have to do it anymore for a while, hopefully. I got a good report from the doctors this week, so I'm, I'm good. So I got all the cancer, so I'm, you all got to put up with me for a while longer. Uh, we can do that. Uh, Sheila, would you lead us in the word of prayer, please? Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to be here today, God. For, Lord, we have the right. We woke up alive. You gave us life. You created us, Lord, in your image. Lord, you're a God of love. You're certainly a good God. All good and wonderful things in our life come from you. Lord, let us never be too busy to take the time to hear you because you know what? You speak to all of us every day. And, you know, we got so many distractions and things that, that interrupt that take your place, but you're the most important thing, Father. And Lord, I, I hail you and I praise your holy name. I thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, that came down here and died for us. Because God, that gives us hope. We're healed by his stripes. No matter all these prayer requests, everything that's happened to us, everybody that's come into this building today, God's got scars, they've got heartaches, they've got burdens, they've got troubles, they've got cares. It's life, it's all part of this human condition. But Lord, we got you, we've got you. And there's nothing too big or too small that you can't handle. And, Lord, you will in your time. Lord, we are a victorious people. We cannot forget that. Lord, we have to concentrate on greater things, higher things, things that endure, things that are eternal. And, God, we get that when we come to you and we ask to be forgiven for our sins. Lord, forgive us of our sins. Instill in us your light and your love. Give us the, the discernment and the wisdom we need day by day to go your way and do your will, Father. Show us what we need to do. Let us be the church wherever we're at. It ain't got to be a building, God. We are your hands and your feet. And God, we got to go out there and we got to show people love. We got to love our own. We got to forgive one another. Oh, Lord, help us. Give us the grace. Give us the, give us the power, Father. You said you would if we asked and if we asked believing. And I do today, God. I want you to touch everybody in here as well as me. I'm so thankful, Father, even to these beautiful flowers here in the ray today, Lord because they remind me of someone else so beautiful, Father, that is in your presence now. I praise you, and I thank you for this church, God, and I thank you for Alan, for, Lord, he has set the example that your son did, the good shepherd, and, God, he, he takes care of his flock, and we're grateful for him. Now, Lord, lift us up. When we fall, pick us up. And, God, we know, even though we're walking through the valley of the shadow, you're there with us, so we've got to remember that. 
is you're a God of love and you're a God of strength and hope and endurance in the best of times and the worst of times because it's in those times we find out what we're really made of. It's in Jesus' sweet and holy name and for our sakes I ask it. Amen. 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 All right. Since we're standing, let's say hey to your neighbors. Glad you're here at church. Got some new faces. Some faces haven't been here in a while, so we're glad to see you. Before we start singing the next song, can I get everybody's attention? Before we... Hello. Everybody listen up. Before we get started, we do celebrate everybody's birthdays, and you'll see them on the calendar as you walk in every single day. Today we have two birthdays, so we thought we'd just do In the house. Special. In the house. Miss Amy, today's her birthday. And Miss Libby, where'd you go? There she is, Miss Libby. So Take happy birthday, ladies. Take a bow. <laughs> oh, tomorrow's Hanks, that's right. Yay! Everybody's having a birthday today. All right. Happy birthday to you. We're going to skip to how old are you part. Nobody wants to know. All right, let's sing something happy and joyous and think about when, when this world is over and we go to our new life, let's think how it's going to be.
I get a lot of credit for things I don't do. Um, I have a bunch of people here behind the scenes to do a lot of stuff to make this church continue to go. I have, when you get a card in the mail where there's a birthday card, a sympathy card, it, it's, it's not me. I have someone here that does that. And I wish I could name everybody and every job they do, but if I do, I'm going to miss somebody. But I have all these people doing all these things so I can take time during the week and prepare a sermon. And if it wasn't for these people behind the scenes, I wouldn't be standing here right now because I couldn't do it all. But I do have a, a letter I'd like to read, a little note here I'd like to read. This says, Dear Just Jesus Community Church family, we are extremely appreciative of the beautiful flowers our church family sent to us when Sheila's brother passed away on Friday, October 20th. Greg Hobbs was a true follower of Christ. He will be missed by many. Also, we are so grateful for all the prayers and condolences we receive through phone calls, letters, cards, and messages. We feel so blessed to have a church family that shows so much love and kindness during our time of loss. J2C2 is so special, and, and through our loss, we are reminded that God loves us all, and while listening on this earth, life is so precious and so fragile. Love and God bless to all, Sheila and Steve Warwick. So we are, we're so glad that you're here today. We realize the loss that you've got, and, and with your father as well, being sick. So continue to keep them in your prayers. And everybody in here, there's, there's so much. Everybody in here is going through something right now. And, uh, and sometimes all we can do is pray. But prayer works, folks. We know that. We have seen that over and over and over and over again. And we're going to talk today about a bridge between sin and salvation. It's in Romans chapter 3. And we're going to cover a lot of scripture this morning, so I will not read it in its entirety. We'll look at it verse by verse. Uh, Romans chapter 3 forms a bridge between sin and salvation. And in this text, Paul first deals with condemnation. In it, he concludes that the whole world, Jew and Gentile alike, are condemned because we are all under sin. Then later, he introduces justification through faith. So first we'll look at the bad news, condemnation under sin. Now Paul asks four important questions here in these first few verses. And we'll look at it. In verse 1 it says, What advantage then is there to being a Jew, or what value is there in circumcision? So his first question here, is there advantage, if there, is there any advantage to being a Jew? Answer is in verse 2, much in every way. First of all, the Jews have been entrusted with the very words of God. So the answer is yes, because the Jews were given, they, and they had in its possession the word of God. Now, had they believed it, had they read it, had they believed it, had they obeyed it, and the nation received Jesus and would have been saved, but they didn't. They, didn't, they chose to follow the law. But there's other advantages to being a Jew here. In Romans 9, <coughs> excuse me, verses 4 and 5, it says, The people of Israel, theirs is the adoption, the sonship. Theirs is divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of the Messiah, who is God over all, forever and praised. So they have been adopted into the family of God. Jesus is in their ancestral line. I wonder if Ancestry.com goes back that far. <laughs> but right now, there are Jews. Valerie and I have a friend from Israel. And uh, right now, she is in Ireland working. But she has family that is over in the war zone. She has, I think she's had some family that have been uh, taken from over there. And so right now, there's a lot of folks 
over there that still don't believe in Jesus. So they really have nothing to grasp, nothing to hold on to. You know, right now she, she says, you know, this heritage of being, you know, in the ancestry of Jesus and adopted into the, in the God's family is not, not much because there's nothing she can hold on to. That is the issue of Jewish faith right now. And that's what he's talking about here. This is exactly what Paul is talking about. So in verse 3, it says, What if some were unfaithful? Will their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? So the question number two is, has Israel's unbelief canceled God's word? Verse 4 is the answer, not at all. Let God be true and every human be a liar as it is written so that you may be proved right when you speak and prevail when you judge. So absolutely not. You, the lack of faith cannot nullify God's faithfulness. He says God is true and every man's a liar. And what he's doing, he is quoting Psalm 51.4 here, where David is openly admitting the sin and God's righteousness in judging him for his sin of adultery, his, with Bathsheba and the murder of her husband. King David has admitted even in his sins he is declaring the righteousness of God and the truth of God's word. Verse 5 is question 3. But if our righteousness brings out God's righteousness more, if our unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, what shall we say? That God is unjust in bringing the wrath on us? Am I using a human argument? Question number 3. Then why not sin more? So we glorify God more. Because when, when we're sinning, it says we're un, God is being honored by our sin because in judging us, he is being honored. So am I not doing him a favor by sinning so that he will be honored even more? It kind of sounds like a, a, a great argument for sinning. So then the question is then why not sin more so God is glorified more? The answers are in verses 6 through 8. Certainly not. If it were so, how could God judge the world? Some might argue if my falsehood enhances God's truthfulness and so increases his glory, why am I still condemned as a sinner? Why not say as some slanderously claim that we say, let us do evil that good may result. Their condemnation is just. See, Paul points out quickly in his answer in verse 6 that in such a position to me, God could not condemn the world. He could never judge the world. Even, even Abraham recognized God as judge of the world in, in Genesis 18. Paul did not explain here how God judges sin and gets glory from it. He merely states that all truth and justice would collapse if God did not judge sin. Our world is a place right now where people have even forgot, either forgotten or they don't believe that God's going to judge us. And even worse than that, some people just don't care. They know what the Bible says. They just don't care. Paul's Jewish enemies had even lied about him and say that he had taught this in verse 8 where he says, let us do evil so, uh, so good may result. This was so contrary to what he was preaching. So he dismissed it by saying they deserve condemnation themselves. So in the first part of verse 9, we have question number 4. It says, do we have an advantage? So he's talking to the Jews here. He's asking... Is the Jew better than the Gentile? He answers it in the second part of verse 9. Not at all. For we have already made the change that Jews and charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. So he's saying, no, the Jew, the Gentile is no better than the Jew. Or the Jew is no better than the Gentile. 
because no one has an advantage when it comes to salvation or damnation. No one. We are all under sin. And Paul uses the singular sin here to make the point that many sins people commit stems from one basic fact, and that we're all, we're all helpless slaves to sin's power. This predicament is only matched by God's work through Jesus. For God's work through Jesus, he breaks the chain. He breaks through and he delivers us from that sin. So now Paul uses five quotes from different Old Testament passages to show that sin is universal. Sin is universal. Verses 10 through 12, it said, As it is written, no one is righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have altogether become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Here is Paul is commenting on the, the sinful characteristics of mankind. The verse begins with there is no, there is no one. He, uh, he begins it that way to show that all people, without exception, are caught up in the grip of sin. The first part of 12, it says, all have turned away. They have all become worthless. These are powerful words. Where are you in your Christian walk? Are you worthless to God? It would be terrible to stand before God and have him say, you are worthless to me. Because the next thing he would say is, depart from me because I never knew you. Verses 13 through 18. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouth are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are shift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways and the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Paul is reminding us of the conduct of sinful people here. And the conduct has not changed in 2,000 years. These verses are describing today's culture. The most dangerous part is verse 18 where it says, There is no fear of God before their eyes. When you have no fear of God, you have no moral baseline. That's why we have transvestites reading kids' stories in libraries. That's why there's pornography in school libraries. That's why there's teachers telling kids it's okay to think you're a girl when you're a little boy. That's why there's doctors performing sex change operations. There is no fear of God. Verse 19 through 20 says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore no one is declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather through the law we became conscious of our sins. This is the final verdict here. Now I like the way if you... If you have the message version of your Bible, I like the way the message uh, writes these two verses. It says, this makes it clear, doesn't it, that whatever is written in these scriptures is not what God says about others, but to us, to whom these scriptures were addressed in the first place. And it's, and it's clear enough, isn't it, that we're sinners, every one of us, in the same seeking boat with everyone else. Our involvement with God's relation doesn't put us right with God. What it does is force us to face our complicity in everyone else's sin. The whole world is guilty before God. 
the law that the Jews thought would save them actually condemned them. The law condemned them. It didn't save them. But the law gave us the knowledge of sin. If God had not given us the knowledge of sin, if he had not given us the law, there would be no distinction between right and wrong. And our world no longer acknowledges this law. That's the bad news. The good news is we have justification by faith. In verse 21 it says, Now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to the law, and the prophets testify. Now through Jesus, there's a righteousness apart from the law. Now this verse can be paraphrased and says, but now in the age of grace, a new kind of righteousness has been revealed that does not depend on the law. People today want righteousness by works. They want to get into heaven by obeying the Ten Commandments and be, by being good. The problem is hell is going to be full of good people. I like to think that I'm a good person. I strive my best to be a good person. But I'm still a sinner. And Paul has proven here that the law condemns and can never save. But this righteousness by faith is nothing new. In Genesis 15, 6, Abraham was declared righteous because of his faith. In Habakkuk 2, verse 4, it says, The just live by faith. And even in Romans chapter 9 here, we see how Israel missed this righteousness by faith. In verses 30 through 33 in Romans chapter 9, it says, what then shall we say? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it, a righteousness that is by faith? But the people of Israel who, pursu who pursued the law as a way of righteousness have not attained their goal. Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, see, I lay in Zion a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And the ones who believe in him will never be put to shame. See, Israel tried to choose, uh, uh, tried to attain salvation by law rather than putting their faith in Christ when he came. The more good news is not only do we have justification by faith, we have justification through Christ. Verse 22 says, This righteousness is given through the faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. So remember back in verse 9, where our sins made us all alike? Now, our belief makes us all equal. No one's better than anyone. Our belief makes us all equal because verse 23 says, For we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time. So as the just and the one who justifies those who have the same faith in Jesus. So Paul introduces three important terms here. The first one is justified. Justified. It means that we are declared righteous in God's sight through the merits of Christ we are secure in our position in Christ. Therefore, the throne of God. We are secure in our position in Christ. And therefore, because he sits at the throne of God and intervenes for us. Justified 
The easiest way to remember it is justified and never seen. So the next ter term here is redemption. Redemption means deliverance from sin and its penalty by the payment of a price. The price was the blood of Jesus on the cross. And the third one is atonement or propitiation in some versions. And it means that Jesus' sacrifice satisfied God's holy law, thus making it possible for God to forgive sinners and to remain just himself. See, God's justice has been satisfied. And now he can look with kindness and grace on a lost world. Verse 24 says, And all are justified by his grace through the redemption that came through Christ Jesus. Justified freely by his grace, not by works, not by good intentions, not even by gifts or prayers, but freely by his grace alone. In verse 26, Paul explains how God can be both just and the justifier. See, when Jesus died, he took on our sins in his body, and so he prayed, paid the price that God's law demanded. Then he rose from the dead. Now he's alive and he's able to save all those that believe. But in verse 25, Paul tells us that before Jesus offered salvation by grace, God appeared to be unjust in the way he passed over the sins of mankind while he was forgiving sins of people like Noah and Abraham and Enoch. And he did send wrath in some cases but generations of sinners there, it, it appeared they seemed to escape the judgment of God. So how was he able to do this? He knew that on the cross, he would give the full display of his wrath against sin, and yet through the death of Jesus, provided redemption for the, for the sins that had been merely covered up by blood of sheep, and goats and bulls. And the best news of all is our justification is accepted by faith. And that concludes the whole matter. The whole matter is done then. If we have that faith, we're justified. It's justified never sin. Verses 27 through 30. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. Because of what law? The law that requires work? No, because of, of the law that requires faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is it God, the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too. Since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through the same faith. Do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. We uphold the law. The Jews have nothing to boast of anymore because all sinners are justified by faith and not by works. If justification is by the law, then God is only the God of the Jews. Because only the Jews had the law. But he's also the God of the Gentiles. We are all saved by the same way. By faith. Ephesians 2, 8 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself. It is the gift of God. If you've never accepted this gift, today's the day of salvation. The Bible says we're all sinners, that we all fall short of the glory of God. But then it says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are God's promises. That everyone 
who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. There are two things God will not do. He will not lie. And he will not break a promise. So if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I pray today will be that day. As I look around the room, I see a lot of familiar faces. I believe that everybody here is has accepted Jesus as their Savior. But there are those that are watching right now that I don't know. I don't know who you are. I don't know if you're saved or not. But I ask right now, if you're not, to call upon the name of the Lord. We're going to open up the altar here just for a minute or two. If everybody would bow their heads, close their eyes. If anyone needs to to come up this morning and pray. If you don't know Jesus, today's the perfect day to come and accept that free gift of His grace. Y'all sing with us now. Kevin, would you come up here, please? Kevin has been dealing with Bell's palsy for a while now, and he's having some issues with his eye. And uh, we're gonna we're gonna pray over him this morning. We're gonna anoint him with oil. If y'all would like to come up and, and pray over Kevin, we're gonna pray that God will take care of his issues, one way or the other, whether it's by his healing hand or by a medical doctor. Father God, we just come before you now on behalf of Kevin. We pray, Lord, that right now you'll start healing this bell's palsy. Father. You'll let him regain his full function of his face, his mouth, his eyes. And you'll take away this uh, eye issue he's having, Father, this pain he's having that is so, bothers him so much, Father, that he has to wear sunglasses all the time. God, we just pray that you take that away right now. We pray, Lord, that uh, we'll leave here today and when we come back next week, we'll get a whole new report that all these things are taken care of, God. Because we know that you are the great physician. You are the great healer. And God, we do humbly come before you and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you, brother.
people who are worshiping our tithes and offerings on the way out with the plates over there. And we, uh, uh, but do we have any more announcements? We have the shoe boxes over here. If you would uh, care to take a couple of shoe boxes for, uh, for some needy kill children, that'd be great. You take them and fill them up. I think there's a date they're supposed to be back by. Yeah, when they're going to fill them Right. Try to get them back next Sunday if you can. If not, give us a call, anybody on there, um, and we'll, we'll meet you and get them for Charlie and Sam. Um, All right. Also, I know we have church dinner on November 7th. It's a couple of weeks away, but it's going to be a big ads right up here on Timber Drive next to the food line. The address is in here. November 11th, I didn't put it in your bulletins. November 11th, we're going to have a building fundraiser yard sale. Um, it's going to be in the parking lot on the back side over here. If you would, get with Scarlett or me or Ann um, to let them know you do have some stuff. We will have tables. We'll have a few tents. But we want to remind everybody, please bring what you would like to donate to sell for the church fundraiser. No clothes. No clothes. And at the end of that, it's going to be from 7 a.m. to 1, we'll have breakfast biscuits, I think. Yep. And I think we'll have hot dogs for lunch. So it's going to be it's a fun time because you get to meet people in the neighborhood or if they're driving by, they see the signs. It's a great way for them to know who we are and what we believe. Oh, and one more thing also, um, the Confederate roses here that Scarlett brought in, these were started at Benny and Sheila's house, and we call this Benny because he, this was his flower. So if you would like a cutting of this, Scarlett is going to uh, prepare some of these over the winter so that they will have some roots and stuff in the spring. So let me know, let Sheila know, let Scarlett, somebody know that you would like one. They're gorgeous. But, Just uh, like he was. <laughs> so we want to make sure if we, if we have one you, you, that you get one. So he was a rose, all right. I've seen his thorns. <laughs> Right, in three weeks, we're going to have our uh, Christmas dinner on December 10th. It's on your bulletin. Please let us know within the next couple of weeks. Let Richard know. Be a sign he's got the front next time here. right. He's got to know and let them give them the head count. We know we've got a certain area, but they want to set it up for us. So. And sisters of strength is next Sunday. And sisters of strength next Sunday. Thank you. I forgot to put that in the bulletin too. Okay. Let's Bible sing a song. Bible, Bible study Thursday night. Uh, at Avonburg Road Baptist Church. Love to have you if you haven't been with us yet. Let's sing your song. Lord, sanctuary for us that we can go to any time, day or night, Father. We pray, God, you prepare us to be a sanctuary for people in this world that uh, we're going to come across this week that do not know you. And God, we pray that you'll give us the boldness and the courage to tell them about you and what you do in our life. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Y'all love each other on the way out. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen.